Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Balaji from Coimbatore Nature Society, and I'm going to talk about uh, talk on the topic of uh, bird migration. And uh, as you already know, I'm also part of uh, Salimali Naturalist Forum, and I've done an online course in ornithology from uh, Bombay Natural History Society. I'm also an eBird reviewer for Coimbatore District. Yeah. So what we're going to do today is uh, um, we're going to discuss some extreme migrants. We're going to take um, some time to try to answer some of the frequently asked questions about migration. Basically, why do uh, birds migrate? Do all birds migrate? And how did migration evolve? And we, get, we do get a lot of uh, migrants from the um, uh, other areas, but why do they have to go back? Why don't they stay here uh, all around the year? That's a question we'll try to answer. And um, we'll also try to look at like what triggers migration in birds. Um, we'll we'll uh, look at how birds navigate, what are the mechanisms they use, and how do we as people track the migratory birds and what are the been so the sort of technologies which have been used over the years and we also briefly discuss about the migratory routes of birds um, some of the typical patterns that we see and uh, uh, how these patterns evolve so we're going to see all uh, touch upon all these topics we have like a very short presentation um, we have about uh, 20 odd slides so um, I'll just go with the presentation. Um, and if you have any questions, we'll save a lot of time towards the end for the q and I hope that's OK with everyone. So we'll proceed with the presentation. Now, uh, I want to start uh, this presentation with discussing some of the extreme migrants. Uh, these are exceptions rather than the rule. Um, one of the extreme migrants, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have are read about is the Arctic tern. So the Arctic tern, um, what happens is this Arctic tern migrates every year and uh, the distance that they travel uh, every year is mind boggling. And they travel some 44,000 miles every year. Um, they go from their breeding grounds in the Arctic, they go all the way to the Antarctic and back every year. So, and uh, some Arctic terns, which have been um, uh, discovered to be um, are doing this for 10, 12 years, and uh, the distance that they cover uh, in their lifetime is sometimes equivalent to the distance from the Earth to the Moon. So, uh, that's how dramatic their migration is every year. And uh, the Barty Godwit uh, holds the record for the longest non-stop migratory flight. Uh, in fact, uh, there was one bird which was um, radio tagged uh, from Alaska. Um, so, and it uh, it flew to uh, New Zealand in uh, its winter winter grounds in New Zealand in a distance of 7,500 miles in kilometer terms. So that's about, roughly about 12,000 kilometers. In an 11 day non stop journey. It didn't stop even for um, a day. It was a non stop journey. And, um, and this is how the bird looks. I'm sure a lot of people might have seen the bird in the field when it uh, comes to winter in India. Um, so, this is one of the extreme uh, migrants. So, the other extreme migrant is the bar headed goose. And the, uh, why it is extreme is because um, it's known to fly over the Himalayas. And um, it, it normally breeds in, um, um, in Mongolia and parts of China. And then it winters in uh, India. We do have a few birds visiting us in Coimbatore and Tirupur as well. Uh, we have seen them in Valayar Lake. We have seen them in uh, Nanjarayan Tank in uh, Tirupur. But the amazing fact about this bird is that uh, this bird is capable of flying over 8,000 meters. Uh, that's, if you uh, think in terms of kilometers, that's eight kilometers 
above the sea level and some have um, seen flying over Himalayas. Some people claim that it has even flown over the Mount Everest, but we don't have uh, enough evidence of that. We know for sure that they are capable of flying uh, over 24,000 feet. So, uh, basically, I think a lot of people have this question that why do birds migrate in the first place? So, I think uh, the main reason birds migrate is because of the uh, food availability every year. Um, so, what happens is like uh, on this picture, you have um, a woodland uh, in the temperate zones. So, what happens is like what is lush green in the summers goes uh, completely leafless and the entire ground is covered with snow in the winters. So when there's no leaf, there's no fruit, there are no flowers, there are no um, insects, they all go into hibernation. So the entire ground is covered with snow in the winters and the birds have like a lot of difficulty finding food. And uh, the other big problem that happens for most of these birds living in the temperate zones is that the uh, the length of the day also, um, the amount of time that they have uh, for feeding every day, that also reduces during the winters. So uh, typically uh, in summers, if you have like 14 hours of daylight, it, it can come down to as low as like um, six hours or seven hours during the winters. So the amount, the food availability itself reduces, the amount of uh, time left for feeding is also reduced. Uh, unfavorable weather conditions, all these are the, probably the reasons why birds uh, migrate. So next, I think the follow-up question to that is that, uh, okay, if that is the case, do all birds migrate? Now, typically, if you see um, around the world, uh, we have like, um, the if you look at the, uh, at the world map, we have the polar zone above uh, 60 degrees north and 60 degrees south, uh, below 60 degrees south is the polar zone. Um, we have the temperate zone near the equator, uh, sorry, tropical zone near the equator. And we have the temperate zone, which is like 30 degrees to 60 degrees north and also temperate zone from 30 degrees south to 60 degrees south. So what happens is like, what people have um, found out is that Birds from northern latitudes, which is typically in the temperate zone, show a greater tendency to migrate. So uh, if you look at an example, if uh, you look at a country like North America, which uh, you can say like it lies entirely in the temperate zone, there are about 750 species that you uh, tend to see in North America, of which 75% are migratory species. But whereas, like, if you could take a tropical country like ourselves, like in India, so we have about 1,400 species of birds. Um, so about 300 of the birds that we see here in India are migratory, uh, which come uh, to India only in the winters, in the summers, they go back. So it's only about 20% of the species that we see here in India are, are roughly the migratory species. So uh, we can see that the birds in the temperate zone show a greater tendency to migrate when compared to the birds in the tropical zone. So, but uh, why do birds in the tropical zone migrate? So see, actually what happens in the tropical zone is that uh, we have alternating dry and wet seasons where because of the food availability chain, um, um, reduces and increases throughout the year. So in response to the change in the climatic conditions also, the birds migrate. And um, so that's uh, that happens in the southern latitudes. And if you see on our family wise, the birds which show a very great tendency to migrate are gulls and terns, waterfowl, uh, baders. So all these families, you'll find that migration, uh, migratory birds are the rule and the resident birds are an exception to the rule. And um, if you um, look at the birds which do not migrate, and like if we can see that uh, woodpeckers, corvids, like let's say crows, tree pies, magpies, all these birds don't migrate. Pheasants, for example, um, uh, peacock uh, doesn't migrate, um, quails, uh, tits, owls, 
a vast majority of the owls don't migrate. We do have migrants, uh, the short-eared owls, like migratory species of owl. The Eurasian eagle owl is a migratory species of owl. But those are the exceptions. They are not the rule. Uh, by and large, uh, birds belonging to these families, they do not migrate. So to answer this question, do all birds migrate? Answer is no. Um, birds in the northern latitudes uh, or in the temperate zones, they show a greater tendency to migrate. And the birds in the su uh, southern latitudes, uh, less tendency to migrate. So, um, um, so we have like basically what is called as a resident birds. So what is shown in this green circle is the area where the bird breeds. So resident birds, um, I mean, the, uh, the shaded green area show where it breeds and the circle outside it shows the area where um, it is probably dispersed, where it, where it is available, but it is not breeding there. Only the dark shaded area is the area where it breeds. And then you have like what is called as a facultative migration where depending on the availability of the food resources that year, the birds uh, choose to um, migrate uh, to a shorter distance or a greater distance. That really depends on the uh, availability of resources in terms of food and things like that. And we have like what is called as an obligate uh, migration where um, um, irrespective of the food availability, uh, these kind of birds, uh, they migrate uh, every year to a fixed destination and back to their home ground for breeding. Um, so this is called as an obligate migration. And um, there is another uh, um, classification called as nomadism, where uh, the bird um, goes from uh, its uh, original uh, breeding area to a point uh, one to point two to point three and point four all of these places um, yeah yeah so all of these places um, uh, the bird is uh, capable of um, of breeding so it's a sort of a nomadic kind of a behavior uh, in India, we have like the Great Indian Bustard, which is a classical example of the nomadic uh, breeding uh, behavior. Uh, even I think uh, the Indian courser, for that matter, is like um, has a very nomadic uh, disposition based on the availability of resources. Um, it breeds in the same area. It, it has a tendency to move out also. Yeah, so, that, um, so this is a terminology that uh, we can... A resident facultative migration and obligate migration and nomadism. So these are the diff different types of um, behaviors that we see um, in terms of migratory birds. So I think uh, the question that a lot of people will have is like, uh, you know, how did migration evolve in the first place? And um, Few of the scientists initially, I think uh, in the 1950s or 1960s, they thought that, you know, uh, we all know that like um, all the continents in the world were like uh, uh, one landmass called Pangaea and uh, about 150 million years ago. And then the continent started uh, drifting after that. So the birds which were part of that one supercontinent um, which used to probably locally migrate because the continent had started moving apart. They uh, started taking uh, this um, uh, migratory journey to their uh, breeding grounds and back again. So, but the problem with that theory is that, uh, you know, uh, the continental drift uh, happened about uh, 100 and 50 million years ago, and then um, um, it, 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 um, uh, actually the world as we know it, um, it's sort of like for 50 million years, it has been fairly constant. Um, in the, um, the last 50 million years or so. And all the modern birds that we see here today evolved 65 million years or later. So the continental drift happened first and the birds evolved later. So this 
theory uh, scientists are no longer supporting so um, i mean i think uh, this theory doesn't hold good anymore what probably would have happened is um, that uh, birds evolved migratory behavior by a um, by natural selection so let's assume that you are a bird uh, here located in mongolia and um, there are five birds to start with just for the sake of assumption we are five birds or five populations of that bird which was breeding in mongolia in china so uh, each of these birds different um, behaved differently during uh, winters so some of uh, one set of population decided to go east and they went into the uh, pacific ocean and uh, because pacific ocean uh, they never found land and perished in their journey so that population um, never returned and another set of uh, birds decided to move north um, and then they uh, when when they moved north of course it was winters they couldn't find food no food so they also couldn't survive so the another set of birds decided to move uh, west uh, into europe where they faced a, sim- a similar kind of uh, climatic situations what they were familiar with in mongolia um so again i think uh, uh, they faced a lot of difficulty finding food they also perished and also the birds which were in mongolia to begin with um they didn't decided not to move at all they also perished so the only set of birds which moved south um to warmer climates during the winters only they survived um and then they came back to raise another uh, um generation so um so as a in a natural selection process um more and the other populations short of perished and the only birds which had learned to move south in the winters they uh, survived so um and a lot of scientists now believe that the natural selection is the process in which the birds uh decided to migrate or not so i think another uh, um, you know when i when i started birding um one of the questions that fascinated me was that you know the birds uh, which come to us in the winters like most of the ducks uh, they come to us because they lack um, in the winters it's very difficult for them to find food so they come to india um places like uh, tropical countries in india where there's abundance of food for them in the winters but uh, the uh, the problem here is like why do they have to go back i mean um since there's uh, adequate supply of food uh, uh, here in the india uh, why don't they stay uh, here and they breed here why do they have to go back at all and that was a question which plagued me for a very long time and i had to go through a lot of uh, textbooks to understand uh, why that was now if you look at the map of the world um you, you see i think if you look at the northern latitudes there's typically a lot of uh land in the north when compared to the land in the south so a bird which is going um which uh, decides to breed um will first of all uh look for places where there is less less competition for food so in the north there since there is a lot of uh land area when compared to the ones in the south there is very little competition for um food so competition for nesting space and competition for food so that is one of the reasons why the birds go back to the northern latitudes and um, of course like uh, in the summers in the northern latitudes there is an increased day length so if you uh, look at the uh, length of the day uh, in this graph over here if you see the 1st of january the day length is about 7 hours uh, it can go up to uh, 17 hours of daylight and then falls back to 7 hours again so in the short um, uh, months of the summer there is very long daylight hours for the birds 
for feeding um and there's a lot of uh, um uh, you know there's less competition for food there's a lot of uh, time left for them to feed for themselves and also for their chicks so the chicks have like a best better survival rate so there's a uh, in the northern latitudes what happens is in the summers a um, lot of insects emerge uh, in a very the, the summers are very short so there is a lot of insects emerging um, simultaneously um, so this suddenly a very uh, a very abundant uh, food available for the birds so there is very less competition for the nesting space and the other problem in the tropical areas is that we do have a lot of mammals we do have a, like a lot of reptiles we do have a lot of amphibians and uh, we do have a lot of birds of prey uh, but when compared to um, compare the same situation to northern latitudes because it's very cold we don't have like a lot of reptiles there so as a consequence uh, the tropical birds the uh, um, i mean the rate of survival of the tropical birds is very low in fact according to one of the studies um, they say that you know 80% of the birds um, chicks don't survive the first year of their life in the tropics so that's one of the reasons why the birds have to go back to their uh, breeding grounds in the north uh, northern latitudes um, uh, for breeding and uh, they only come here for very short time during the winters so actually i think uh, we have sort of understood like you know uh, why birds migrate and uh, how migration is evolved and why birds have to go back during the uh, summers so but you know um, from um, i mean actually uh, they are from a strictly um, knowledge perspective we have to also understand what is that that triggers migration and you know how does a bird know when to migrate and when to stay in the same place how do birds understand that so i think um, okay so birds sort of um, are able to perceive the change in the day length in the summer grounds if the days are getting longer it means that they have to go back for their nesting grounds and also the temperatures are also uh, rising uh, these are all uh, and the atmospheric uh, pressure also changes you know all these changes what happens is um it triggers um in the pituitary gland of the uh, uh, bird what happens is like uh, it uh, increases secretion of the hormones and because of this uh, the birds a lot of the uh, the bird undergoes a lot of physiological uh, changes in its body and we'll see what some of the changes are and um, the day length is the most uh, important uh, change that the birds see and they decide to um, migrate so what are the physiological changes that a bird undergoes you know before migration you know actually i think uh, humans are not capable of doing this but the birds can actually shrink their internal organs to provide space for their fat deposits so uh, even if i try i will not be able to shrink the size of my heart or my liver or my lungs or whatever but the birds are able to do that and um, the birds actually uh, put on some up from anywhere from 25 to pers uh, 50% of extra body weight just before the onset of migration so uh, on the on the on the um, uh, illustration here you can see that the bird as this one has a lot of fat deposits in it compared to the uh, bird on the right so um the bird is able to put on a lot of uh, a weight just before uh, migration because migration requires a lot of energy and uh, the fat reserves in the body help uh, give the bird that energy because as we saw in some of the extreme migrants like the black tail the bar tailed godwit 
the bird is uh, migrating for days to end without any break. So uh, they'll only be able to do that if they have the fat reserves in them. And uh, what happens is like the birds also um, molt before migration. So uh, this is a very familiar bird in our wetlands, but you will not be able to recognize it in the breeding plumage. This is the rough RUFF uh, in its breeding plumage. And uh, on the right, you have the bird, same bird in its non-breeding or uh, just before the onset of uh, breeding, they undergo molt, they shed all these uh, fancy feathers. Uh, they undergo molt and um, they become like very lightweight just before um, uh, the onset of migration. Yeah, so uh, the birds also show a lot of behavioral changes in the, uh, before migration. Uh, we have like uh, three um, German terms, uh, Zugti position, Zugstimang, and Zugunruhe. Uh, these are like three terms which are uh, used to describe their behavioral changes. Zugti position basically says um, the preparation for migration, so in, it involves a very heavy feeding and fattening. Zugstimang basically uh, describes their um, um, you know, just uh, the birds take to flight and maintain the migratory flight. And Zukunruhe basically refers to the migratory or uh, nocturnal restless behavior. So these birds uh, undergo these behavioral changes also just before the onset of migration. Okay, so, um, no, I think uh, one of the other fascinating questions that uh, a lot of people have um, is that how do birds navigate? How do they know where to go um, from the place where they are normally uh, breeding in or wintering in? And um, uh, how they decide to uh, go? You know, it basically, um, you know, in order to reach from one place to another place, you need uh, basically two things. You need a compass to show you which direction to go, and you also need a map. Um, so that's how we navigate. Um, so without these, uh, we'll be totally lost. And it's the same with the birds as well. Uh, the birds also have like an internal compass and an internal map, but it's slightly different. Um, they don't have like a physical compass and a physical map. They have internal compass and an internal map, and we are going to see how the birds are able to do that. So uh, what happens is like in the bird's beak, there are like tiny particles of a compound called as magnetite, so which, uh, which help the bird detect the Earth's magnetic pole, uh, the magnetic uh, field. So uh, the magnetic field of the Earth is very strong towards the poles, which is North Pole and the South Pole, and it tends to become very weak towards the equator. So the bird is able to um, use the magnetite in their uh, beaks to help understand the magnetic field and uh, uh, which they use for uh, orienting themselves to that direction um, where they need to go. And in their, uh, in their head, they have like very tiny particles of iron oxide, so which also seems to help them. So the iron oxide and their uh, magnetite both help uh, these birds uh, sense the magnetic field, they use it as a compass. So, um, so they have the compass, so what about the map? So actually the birds are able to use the sun and the stars for their um, uh, guidance. So. Um, so actually, uh, the birds, there are two types of birds, um, migratory birds, one which, uh, the ones which migrate during the night and the ones that um, migrate during the daytime. So the ones that migrate during the nighttime, is here, they are able to use the positions of the stars that they see in the night sky, and they're able to uh, use that to orient themselves. 
and um, and another uh, um, and the uh, the birds which are migrating during the daytime, they're using uh, the sun's position to uh, orient themselves. So they're using the night sky and the sun's position to um, these two things serve as like a, some sort of a map uh, for the birds to uh, basically tell them like where they need to go. And there's also a lot of genetic encoding also. Some of the um, um, birds, it's just like inbuilt. Um, the birds just need uh, understand like that they need to go uh, from this place to this place and that uh, they don't help seek the help of their elders, um, the older birds, they just go there. And uh, for some birds like cranes, for example, um, the first, uh, the juvenile birds follow the uh, older birds to their wintering grounds and they learned by experience. And if they have not followed uh, any older bird Previously, they somehow uh, guess, get disoriented and they um, end up in a place where there shouldn't be. So there's a, an element of uh, experience also. There's a, an element of genetic encoding also. And then there's an element of compass, uh, I mean, uh, a magnetic uh, the deduction of the Earth's magnetic field, the night sky. A combination of all these uh, things help the bird navigate um, to the wintering grounds. So the next thing is like, um, we know how uh, the birds are able to um, uh, navigate and uh, they're able to migrate to uh, their wintering grounds from their summer grounds. Now, how have people traditionally tracked migratory birds? How they know what they know about uh, migratory birds? No, actually in the 1950s, uh, 1940s and 1950s in the North America, for example, uh, what they were doing is like they used to observe the moon and uh, they used to count the birds which come in front of the moon. And the, um, and uh, people living in various parts of the East Coast and the West Coast, they used to count the number of birds um, crossing the moon and that used to tell them the uh, size of the flock and uh, the general direction in which the birds were headed. And after the advent of the radar technology, uh, what they have done is like they use the Doppler radar to find out like, you know, the movement of birds. So that's the picture um, um, that you see on the right. So they were able to detect a huge uh, flocks of birds migrating using the help of radars. And uh, each uh, bird, for example, a warb warbler will have like a different. So as I said, like uh, the Doppler radio was a great boon in understanding the uh, migratory uh, birds. So, uh, you know, I think um, based on the different uh, birds, like whether they were songbirds or warblers or uh, bigger birds like uh, cranes, they they had like a, a very different kind of signature in the uh, Doppler radio and they were able to uh, find out whether the migratory birds that they were seeing on the screen were uh, warblers or um, cranes or whatever. So. In the 1950s and 60s, this was the um, technology which was used to track migratory birds. Yeah, so I think uh, 1950s onwards, another technology called the bird banding or uh, bird ringing, that became like very popular uh, because um, the birds could be um, like, uh, you know, the, the plover that you see here, it was uh, ringed with the help of tags. Um, and these these birds were released back into the wild. And if if at all like the birds were uh, found dead, the people would um, send these details to the um, the tagging organization. And uh, over years, these tags would tell them like you know uh, their um, the the places in which the birds were recovered would tell a little bit about uh, their migratory path. And now I think um, off late, like we have like a lot of technology available with our hands. Uh, we have like uh, uh, <clears throat> transmitters, which could be attacked, attached to the bird. Uh, we have like cellular GPS, satellite GPS, satellite Doppler, 
GPS data loggers and the geo loggers. Now all these different type of technologies are available. Um, and um, the problem with this uh, different technologies is that, um, uh, you know, um, it becomes very easy if the bird is very large. For example, the size of uh, the bar headed goose, you can easily attach like um, uh, cellular GPS to that bird. Uh, but the problem is like uh, the GPS unit with its solar panel and the transmitter and everything, it becomes like heavy. I mean, it's about 22 grams. And how do you attach a 22 gram uh, satellite a tag to a warbler, which only weighs about eight grams? So the bird uh, will face a lot of difficulty in flying. So, and the smaller and smaller you go, it becomes more and more expensive. Um, so that's like a challenge that we have at the moment. So not all birds are being satellite tagged, only like uh, the larger birds are being satellite tagged. And for the rest of the birds, the smaller birds, for example, um, we are still relying on the bird ringing and bird banding to understand their migratory routes. So, um, and I think with the uh, technology growing by leaps and bounds every year, this problem uh, will probably uh, be solved in a um, very short time. And we'll be able to tab, we tag all the birds, whether it's like a small sunbird um, or a warbler, um, they'll all have uh, different uh, size tags available for them. So, um, you know, actually, I think uh, next important talk on the topic or the last topic for the day is like uh, the migratory routes of birds. You know, um, we have seen like how the birds migrate, um, what are the physical and uh, um, behavioral changes that they exhibit during migration. And they also, um, um, the way that they choose the migratory route is not very, um, you know, they know that they have to uh, migrate from the north to south, but they don't always move um, in a straight line. And uh, if you look at the migratory pathways of these birds, um, it's very, very peculiar and very interesting as well. So most of the birds, they avoid uh, flying over water. Um, so uh, if you look at the birds which are in uh, North America, um, uh, for example, in Alaska and Canada and all these areas, they sort of like um, fly in a very uh, shaped pathway. Uh, so they use their landmass like the Panama Straits, uh, Panama Canal. Um, uh, in this case, like in the case of North America, they use the Gulf of Mexico. They sort of like avoid the uh, flying over the water body. And they, um, they sort of take a very circuitous uh, pathway to fly to their southern or wintering home, uh, home grounds. And they, uh, they typically follow the same route on the way back also. And whereas like if you see the birds that are migrating in, um, in Egypt, uh, for example, uh, Europe to Africa and Europe to Asia, you'll find a similar kind of pattern. So if you can see that um, the birds in the Eastern Europe, they fly through the Suez Canal to the wintering grounds in uh, Africa, um, Central and South Africa. And the birds which are flying from um, places like United Kingdom and France, they take the Straits of Gibraltar. Um, that's like, you know, just below like Spain and Portugal to, um, to Morocco to their wintering grounds in Africa. So, you know, uh, so this like, um, you know, gives it like a very unique opportunity for a lot of bird watchers. For example, if you are a bird watcher in America, if you like uh, at the peak of the migration season and you go to Panama, uh, you have a chance to see a lot of uh, huge flocks of birds flying um, to the southern wintering grounds uh, at the peak of the migratory season. And the same with the, uh, the Straits of Gibraltar also. If you go to Spain during the peak of the migratory season, you can see a lot of birds uh, flying south or on their return pathway to the north also. Uh, but in India, unfortunately, we don't have like um, 
um, you know, a geographical bottleneck like we have in um, the other countries. But we do have like the Khyber Pass, which is uh, serves as a um, bottleneck for a lot of migratory species which are coming into India from uh, the Western Europe um, to India and uh, from Central Asia to India. So the Khyber Pass would be like a geographical bottleneck for us. Yeah, so, um, and actually, so as I said, the migratory birds tend to avoid flying over water and they also tend to avoid flying over mountains. So um, if you see like, you know, in the mountain ranges in the, um, uh, the North America, they're oriented from north to south. Whereas the mountain ranges from in Europe are typically um, oriented from west to east. So, you know, that has like a big influence on the migratory pathways of the birds. Um, so they prefer narrow land bridges uh, like the Isthmus of Panama, like in America, the Straits of Gibraltar, uh, whether you, if you are a bird uh, in Europe uh, flying to Afri Africa, there's a Khyber Pass is like a very important uh, migratory pass for birds uh, traveling into India. Um, so there are also several passes in the um, Eastern Himalayas also, uh, like the Sela Pass, the uh, um, and all these uh, other passes on the Eastern Himalayas also. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> if you summarize the migratory pathway of all the birds in the world, we come across like eight different uh, migratory pathways, uh, which are called as flyways. And India happens to be in the, um, uh, in the intersection of three major flyways for migratory birds. We are part of the West Asia or the East Asia flyway. We are part of the Central Asian flyway and also the East Asia or the Australasia flyway. So uh, India is like a very important migratory route for a lot of birds um, traveling uh, from um, you know, uh, Siberia to Africa or from Europe to uh, Australia, um, you know, um, from uh, Central Asia to uh, India. So it's uh, India lies at the intersection. So um, because of this geographical factor, we do get a lot of uh, migratory birds in India as well. So um, now, uh, you know, I think we have covered a lot of ground in this presentation today. Um, we have seen like, you know, why birds migrate. Uh, we try to answer, do all birds migrate? And how did uh, migration evolve? Uh, why do migratory birds have to go back? Um, what triggers migration? What, uh, how do birds navigate? How do uh, people track migratory birds and the migratory routes of birds? So <clears throat> I've sort of tried to keep the presentation as uh, simple as possible without being too simplistic. And um, I mean, I think I um, we can have like a follow-up uh, presentation for the migration um, in the next week if there's a lot of interest in this topic and we can try to answer uh, some more questions and we have like a, we can take a deeper dive, uh, dive into migration if a lot of people are interested in this topic. Um, so that's all I have for today. Uh, thank you very much for a very patient listening. And um, uh, these are my contact information for people who don't know me. Um, I'd be very happy to answer questions right now. And uh, thank you so much for a very patient listening.